Yug. They Yug. put three mogs together in Mog Mob. Yug. They took three of the mogs and they put them together on one card. That's crazy. <laughs> That's fucking that. that <laughs> I love their explanation for that. Oh yeah. <laughs> They were like, they were like, yeah, we did it with Lanawar tribe, where we just took three Lanawar elves and we put them together, and then we did it with some fucking birds, and now we're gonna do it with the Mog Mob, and it's actually got a pretty cool ability of just sack, and then you deal three damage divided as you choose among one, two, or three targets, which is pretty cool. It's a That's three mana cool. three three. It's on rate. It's a Gabo. Everyone loves a good Gabo. Well, the cat brought the string in, so she's going to want to play. So there's going to be shenanigans that are going to be happening again. But that's just kind of par for the course for the duels. And Mana Dorks Podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. We are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And uh, we like to we like to talk about Magic the Gathering and, and Dungeons and Dragons. And, and that's, t- uh, today, that's what we're going to do, because there's, got been, both. there's been things that have been talked about. For both of them. For both of them. For both of them. Oftentimes, we have nothing. For both of them. Yeah, for both of them. So, of course... We're going to have some big news with the Modern Horizons 3 video debut where they finally showed us the commanders for the commander deck. Yes, the modern set has commander decks. Lol. Uh, we also got to see a lot of cards revealed for it, and they get to kind of talk about the the design philosophy mm-hmm. and some of the lot of the inside jokes they have. Um which I think is a little bit cringe, but you know, whatever. Uh, Game Informer also did an article about 1D&D, specifically the player's handbook. We learned some interesting info. Uh, we got to see the cover art, finally. Remember that Remember that art of the dwarf that everyone was freaking out was AI art? It isn't. But they were freaking out that it was AI art, and they were like, oh my god, the cover of the, the player's handbook is going to have AI art on it. It's not the cover, it's the fighter. Just a, just one of the pictures. It's the fighter character art. <laughs> so... Everyone calm down. Uh, but we're going to talk about the, the, the D&D article and about the return of Greyhawk. Yeah. The plane of Greyhawk for D&D, which is exciting. And then we're going to wrap it up with the MTG ban list. One, uh, one card I, be- I beloved has been banned in Popper, the most fun format. That's not true. It's not the most fun format, but it's a good format. And we're going to talk about some Bloom Barrel stuff, as, as we are oft known to do. We do. We do. So, but before we get into that, we're, gonna, we're just going to kind of relax a little bit. We're going to chill. We got energy high. We just watched the debut video. It was a... It was a... It was cringe. It was, it was a marketing material. It was super material. campy. Yeah. It's I, all marketing material. I love it because, you know, some of the... you know, they, Obviously, everything was scripted. And they're kind of like, you know, maybe not scripted down to the T, but they're kind of like, here's what you're going to do. And they're I, all media trained. They're all media. But I really love when when they handed the one person uh, the the commander cards, and they're like, oh, and she's like, oh, these are the new commanders for the commander. Jester, you're being a menace already. <laughs> we're are, minutes in. We're, we're minutes in, and you're already menacing. Mere moments. And she's like, <laughs> you know, they could have made it realistic. She's like, oh, these are really cool. Instead, it'd be like, oh, these are the new commanders. What the fuck does this do? What does that do? What does that do? This is a novel. Oh, I can't. And that one one guy was like, oh, I can't wait to open up these packs and like get a new rare or mythic. And then and then like smash. It would be hilarious to smash cut to someone opening. It's like, ah, yes, a rare. This one's ten cents. I have three of them. <laughs> I have three of them already, and one pack left to go. <laughs> <laughs> Just and Ulalek. Ulalek, yes. Ulalek. I that's Ulamog and Kazalek. Have apparently fused into Ulalek, yeah. which is hilarious, I might add. And is the commander for the Eldrazi deck, which is a six color deck because it's both specifically noted colorless mana and then all five colors of mana. Yeah. That deck's gonna be a fucking monstrosity. Though, that is kind of the point. That is, the, that is the point, yeah. It's also, it's also the one most likely to have more fetch lands in it than the others because the fetch lands are being reprinted in modern horizons 3 yes um and since it's five color six color it's probably going to want a lot of the fetch lands if not i wouldn't put all of them in it that would be fucking nuts if the commander precon for the eldrazi they... had all of the fetch lands in it. imagine um, i assume you're talking the normal fetches uh yeah normal not, fetches. not the slow fe- imagine the, well because last year when they put out the sliver precon which of course was a big news then yeah uh it was only slow fetches. It was only yeah. slow. It was a bunch of tap lanes, a bunch of slow fetches. So imagine that you're like you're the slivers. You're like I'm one of the most noted and powerful tribes in Magic history. And then a year later, you're like I have two tapped lands that I'm fetching for. At the I have to t- it put comes in tapped, and then I have to tap it to fetch something that will also enter tapped. Yeah, yeah. 
It's not fun. It, no. They that. did the same thing with the Painbow commander deck with mm-hmm. uh, Jared Carthal- or Je- yeah, Jared Carthalian, the Planeswalker, the five-color Planeswalker, which is a good pre-con. Got a lot of good pieces in it, but those tapped fetches are just awful. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're really not fun. They're really, really not fun. Uh, we, we normally like to start off by just a little bit of vamping of, of what we've been playing and that kind of stuff. I mean, I finished Final Fantasy VII Remake, mm-hmm. and we're working on characters for a new D&D game that we're going to be playing in. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. Got a fighter barbarian. It's got an a, ASMR. Got a sorcerer. What kind of sorcerer? Storm sorcerer. Storm. Storm. Storm sorcerer. Mm. A lot of lightning. A lot of lightning. Yeah. Hello, Thor. Weak Thor. Atrophy Thor. <laughs> <laughs> muscular atrophy Thor. <laughs> muscular atrophy. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. But we're just gonna gonna we're just gonna dive right into it. Um, before we get into the upcoming releases, as Sam always goes over the upcoming releases, so you're aware because there's a lot of shit, there's a lot of random stuff and a lot of dates to keep track of. I do want to just give you a quick rundown of the Duels of Mandorks podcast. You can get it every week early on our Patreon, patreoncom slash Bros, where you can get the podcast. Uh, one week early on Wednesdays at around 1230. It might be a little bit later. You never know. Uh, but that is the what we normally have been doing for posting the podcast. The podcast will then go and be available for free for everyone the following Monday. So as of the recording of this, if you're on our Patreon, you can watch the episode tomorrow. Uh, if you don't want to send us money, which is also fine, you can join our Patreon for free for free and if you do so you'll be able to submit questions comments concerns thoughts and ideas to the podcast for us to answer at the end we've got a couple from the patreon this week it's a fresh patreon which is fine and you can also uh vote on polls for video ideas and and content plans and all of that kind of stuff which is great and to support us everywhere else just like subscribe and uh, send us to your friends that always helps us too yes and and on podcast services around the globe the reviews and the ratings Give me like Apple Podcasts specifically. Apple the Podcasts. rating, the ratings, and getting consistent review ratings from people is what really pushes podcasts in the algorithm on those podcasting platforms. But you can get us anywhere you listen to your podcasts: Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music. Leave us a review. We also go live on TikTok every week where we play Magic: The Gathering and. We just started doing the live streams on the YouTube as well with a proper top-down camera. It's got some nice graphics, got some nice background music. You can chat with us. You can see the chat on screen. It's a wonderful time. You can also follow us on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Discord, all of that jazz. But Sam, let's go through the upcoming releases. We got something out. Yes, out right now. Vecna, Eve of Ruin. Uh, is out on D and D Beyond and at your local game store. Uh, this and the, everywhere and everywhere as of today. Ah, of as of today. Uh, there's also Vecna, the Nest of the Eldritch Eye, which is a prequel adventure for lower levels. Uh, that has been available for four ninety nine now on D and D Beyond mm-hmm. since pre orders are over. Yep, if you got your pre order, you would have gotten it for free. Yeah, it would have been nice. But you, you too didn't late. act in time. Too late. I didn't. Nope. <laughs> I didn't act in time. <laughs> uh, next up, next month on June 18th, not a D&D adventure, but the making of original D&D 1970, a little coffee book history table. And then finally, the last release for the 2014 edition of Dungeons & Dragons Quest from the Infinite Staircase. Uh, that is the anthology for this year, and it'll be available on D&D Beyond and at your local game stores on July 9th with a full release on July 16th. Coffee book? Coffee table book? You said coffee book table history. Coffee history table book is what you said, I think. Coffee Rewind ta- it. Coffee table Rewind history it. book. Coffee table what? Coffee table history book. Yes, that is correct. Okay, yes. cool. We've corrected it for the <laughs> for the record. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, moving on to the what we w- refer to as one D and D, of course, the twenty twenty four. Revision of D and D five E. The one D and D player's handbook will be available on February. Uh, sorry, on September seventeenth of this year. The one D and D Dungeon Master's Guide will be available on November twelfth, and next year on February eighteenth, we'll have the Monster Manual. Yeah, we got some got some fun uh, Dungeon Master's Guide information from that Game Informer article as well as the player's handbook. Yeah, moving on to Magic the Gathering. Uh, just as we have talked about a lot at the top of this episode, Modern Horizons three, the pre release will restart the the pre release will start on June seventh with the full release on June fourteenth. Then in July, on July fifth, we'll have the Assassin's Creed Universes Beyond set. Set set in quotation marks. Uh it's it's gonna be so bad. I'm so The sad. new game looks cool. 
Yeah. But, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people don't like that there's black samurai, but that's a whole other... I think it looks cool. <laughs> they have the lightest character in video game history. <laughs> it's like she fucking boots somebody and then gets backhanded and flies like 20 feet. Yeah, I mean... I, it's it, it's giving JRPG vibes, honestly. But this is not a video game podcast. No, no, no. Uh, we'll move on to Bloomboro. Uh, like we said, we got some spoilers about that. Uh, the pre-release for that will be on July 26th with the full release on August 2nd, which you're you're going to Gen Con. Ooh. Come that, say hi. It's that, that weekend. We'll be there. We'll be there. Come probably, say hi. Probably playing some Bloomboro. Yeah. But there's pre, there's Bloomboro pre-con yeah. pods that we'll probably be partaking in. Uh, and I'm hoping to get a starter kick because I specifically want Bria the the riptide otter thing yes because because prowess and unblockables and i, I have it. a narset enlightened exile deck that will love that Eight. <laughs> finally uh this year we'll have duskmorn this is going to be a horror slasher flick theme set duskmorn house of horrors that'll be available for us in q4 we don't have full release dates on that i'm surprised we don't I know. That's, I, I would have thought we'd have that by now because we've had we've had Bloomboro for a hot minute. We've mm-hmm. we've had we've had a yeah. lot of the other dates for a while. Keep so. checking Dustmorn and it still just says Q4. Yeah. If you wanted to uh, play test Daggerheart, which is also a big new TTRPG at Gen Con, too late. They were immediately sold out. Oh, I'm not surprised because like on Sunday they released the events for Gen Con, so you could actually sign up and buy tickets for them. Mm-hmm. And I was going to text you and our friend Lincoln and be like, Hey, do we want to get a? Do we want to like? organize like pick a pick one of the events and we can go to one of them and we can play dagger heart together uh, and then i looked and they were all sold out like immediately yeah so i'm not surprised i'm not surprised either but oh well what was the uh, what was the event that travis ran last year at gen con <sighs> were they running through nether deep was it it might mm, i don't remember if it was nether deep or if it was the other the the smaller ttrpg they put out oh oh yeah 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 the uh candela obscura yeah i remember those also sold out immediately oh yeah the nether deep ones didn't cuz i don't think they were being ran by critical role i think yeah. other people were doing the nether deep but the chapters. ones by critical the, the ones that are going to have the people that people want to see yeah and i don't and i don't is the cast actually doing the dagger heart stuff or are they just going to like be I there i don't know from? they're probably just going to probably be, be there, there. But not like running the games, probably. I don't know. All I'm saying, I can see like Talison running some though. All I'm saying is, if we're if we get invited to something again, and we get a traipse around and run into uh, run into famous people again, again, <laughs> that would be awesome. So uh, That'd be great. yeah, Ra- Randy, if you're if yeah, you're we, need hit up, we need to hit up Randy. Hit up Randy. Make a note. Make a note of that. This episode of the Duels of Mana Dorks podcast is sponsored by the Proxy Forge. Proxy Forge makes high quality custom art Magic the Gathering proxies to help you spice up your favorite decks. Upgrade your mana base by getting land packs organized by color combination or land type, be they shock lands, fetch lands, or even original dual lands. You can start a brand new deck with the commander starter packs for expensive and popular commanders like Edgar Markov or Kalia the Vast at a fraction of the price. You can even upload your full custom deck list and they can make the entire thing out of custom proxies. They offer a wide variety of singles from all of their packs and cards that aren't even in packs and you can get them as foil versions too. Use the link in our video description or bio to get a free bonus card with your order and bling out your board state with Proxy Forge. All right, well, let's move on to the meat of today's episode. We're going to talk about Modern Horizons 3. They just did the debut video mere minutes ago as of the recording of this, probably like 20 minutes ago. Uh, it, is, it is now one o'clock, so the, the, it started. The video started premiering an hour ago. There we go. So we'll take that. But we've got a lot to go through. We've got the reveals of all the commanders for the Modern Horizons 3 commander pre-cons. Uh, some of them much more powerful than the other ones. Yeah. I mean, they tried to go Two. with some very unique and powerful. They wanted to theme them off of powerful things in modern or like mm-hmm. themes in modern. And they did that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if they're all uh, on the same level, though. <laughs> I don't. I don't either. Um, I think two of them stand out to me as particularly more powerful than the other two. Mm-hmm. Uh, just on the face of the commander, this is completely devoid of knowing what the deck lists are. Right. I will say, uh, and those two are the first two that we see here. First one, Ulalek, <laughs> the fused atrocity, uh, which is a fusion of Ulamog and Kozilek. This is the Eldrazi deck, the six color Eldrazi deck. Costs five mana, each of them a hybrid of specifically colorless, and then each of the colors of mana. For a 2-5 Eldrazi with Devoid, and whenever you cast an Eldrazi spell, you may pay two colorless. If you do, copy all spells you control, 
then copy all other activated <laughs> activated and triggered abilities you control. You may choose new targets for the copies. Man abilities can't be copied, as per the use. As per the use. So awkward moment. Um, we had to change shirts because we got so sweaty. It got so it got so hot in here with all of these Modern Horizons three uh, uh, debut information and the other previews of the day. Yeah. That we had to change our clothes because we were getting so hot and heavy in here. Uh, totally not because of um, audio recording issues. Anyway, we were talking about Ulalek. Yeah, Ulalek, <laughs> the new Ulalek. The... <laughs> it gets funnier every time. It. I love sure. it. Sure. So we know we know the backup commanders as well. So Ulalek, fused atrocity. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about this uh, triggered ability here. The whenever you cast an Eldrazi spell, you pick two colorless. Um, Sam's done a little bit of yes. research since we've changed our clothes from being so sweaty. Yeah, we uh, had a few minutes while you were taking extra time in the bathroom, just exactly. like m- m- mopping off. You oh, know, I was kind of, mopping. You were mopping. I was mopping. But uh, there's some considerations for the stack. Yes. Yeah, so the full ability is whenever you cast an Eldrazi spell, you may pay colorless colors. If you do copy all spells you control, then copy all other activated and trigger abilities you control, you may choose new targets. So... If you're just casting Sor- uh, Eldrazi at sorcery speed, you are going to get any cast triggers you have, things like Cascade, things like a Beast Whisper, draw a card, and then the Eldrazi spell itself. You get to copy those if you pay Colorless Colorless. Now, you can't activate anything in response. Well, you can. You can, but it would be after. It would be after, so it would resolve before the trigger goes off. So what you have to do, there's really three options. Option one. Cast your Eldrazi at instant speed. This can be done with the leyline of the of the sorry leyline of abundant. Nope. A- anticipation. Anticipation. Videlkin orrery born upon the wind. Things like that. So you fill the stack and then you cast your Eldrazi. Mm-hmm. The second thing you could do is use the uh, uh, kindred instance, the formerly mm-hmm. tribal instance uh, that have changeling in them. Because the, uh, with the changeling, they become every creature type, which includes Eldrazi. So you fill the stack, you cast these, like, uh, uh, Crib Swap. Crib Swap is a good example. Um, and then you would be able to, that would count, Ulek would see that as a Eldrazi spell, and you'd be able to, and trigger ability would go on stack. The third option is you fill, is you cast your uh, Eldrazi spell, then you fill the stack, and then you use a specific ability that copies a triggered ability, the, and you choose the uh, Ulek. Then you pay for that copy, and then you can just let the uh, original go away without paying without paying for it so there's a couple workarounds and i'm sure the precon is going to have at least a couple of them Mm -hmm. um i wouldn't be surprised if they did uh like a universe as we within of like born upon the wind or Mm -hmm. like just one of the utility lands was like an emergent zone or something yeah uh just to let you do things in instant speed Uh, but the backup commander i find a little bit more early game friendly yeah or, or new player friendly and both arguably a little bit fuckier depending on how this precon is built uh that is aslask the swelling scourge it's a three mana two two eldrazi whenever aslask the swelling scourge or another colorless creature you control dies you get an experience counter you as the player you're getting a counter yes yes you can then pay white blue black red green and then creatures you control get plus x plus x until end of turn where x is the number of experience counters you have then specifically scions and spawns you control gain indestructible and annihilator one until end of turn so this is going to buff your entire board regardless of the creature type and then if you specifically have eldrazi scions and eldrazi spawn they're going to become indestructible while receiving that buff yeah. and then gain annihilator one as well going to be a little bit easier to get that ability online and get use out of it than Ulalek. Yeah, it's a much more straightforward um, battle cruiser style mm-hmm. play, especially because a lot of Eldrazi's already make these spawns and scions and they're colorless creatures, so mm-hmm. first couple of turns you make a bunch of them, put put down Aslak. Uh, I would say put down Aslak earlier on turn three so that you can start getting that ex- those experience counters if it or other colorless creatures you have die. Like well, if you're getting your if you're getting your spawn out and then sacrificing them, sort of a thing. I mean, just yeah, well, I'm saying yeah, collect your uh, spend the first few turns ramping, getting out these you know do whatever you can to get these spawns out, and then okay, Aslak's down, cool. 
pop pop a bunch of them, get a bunch of experience counters because it doesn't say once per turn or anything. Nope. Like a lot of times things will be like once per turn or or a trigger that will be once per turn, like a beginning of combat or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, this will be strong. It, it will be very strong. It will be very strong. The Eldrazi one's going to pop off for sure. We're then going to move to the Jeskai deck. This is the energy counters deck, probably the second most powerful deck uh, for the pre-con cycles. We have Satya, Aetherflux Genesis, backed up by Kaith, famed Mechanist. Uh, Satya is one blue, red, white for a 3-5 human artificer with Menace and Haste. Whenever Satya attacks, you create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of up to one other target non-token creature you control, and you get two energy counters. At the beginning of the end step, sacrifice that token unless you pay an amount of energy equal to its mana cost. Casting, casting him, he's going to have haste so you can attack with him immediately, and copying your creatures is always going to be a big thing, mm -hmm. and being able to sometimes keep that creature around if you have accrued enough energy and are willing to spend it on it. I mean that's that's classic that's classic Jeskai bullshit. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You you you're gonna have to be uh, uh, you know when you hit, when he goes down whatever you have swinging available it's gonna be great. What I think a lot of players are gonna fall in the trap of is oh no now I'm gonna have to pay to keep this thing around. No no just let that thing go. Just let it die. Wait till you get the big thing. Yeah. That'll be cool. Keep the big thing around. Uh, the backup commander of Kaith famed Mechanis. Also, one blue, red, white for a 3-3 Dwarf Artificer with Fabricate 1. For those of you that don't know, Fabricate 1 is when this creature enters the battlefield, you put a plus one, plus one counter on it, or create a 1-1 one, one Colorless Servo Artifact Creature token. Then, other non-token creatures you control have Fabricate 1, so they will also be entering with either a plus one, plus one counter on themselves, or generating you a Servo. You also have an activated ability of two mana tap, and you get to choose one between populate mm -hmm. and proliferate. Those two keywords, populate, you are copying a token that you have, and you're getting another token version of it. And then proliferate, you are adding counters to whatever you would like, effectively. Yeah, I think this is a... Uh, this is probably not what the deck is going to really want. Obviously, the proliferate is going to be pretty good with the energy counters, because you can do it on uh, on any permanents and players when you mm -hmm. proliferate. Uh, however, this will probably be a, a, a creature that you might want to pull out later and build a different deck around either focusing on the proliferate or yeah. the populate. This is this is definitely better as a lieutenant to Satya, mm -hmm. simply because of the populate part of the activated ability, where you can get the copy of this of a creature with Satya and then use mana to create another token copy of it, yeah, and then you don't have to spend your energy counters keeping it around. That'd be pretty cool. So I think that's the better way to go about that. So I, it, while for me, I feel like in the Eldrazi deck, I think I would rather run Aslask mm -hmm. over Ulalek. I would I would keep with the face commander of Satya for. I think counters. I would as well. Yeah, especially because, like I said, that's how the deck is probably going to more be built with everything saying energy on it into yeah. the battlefield, artifacts, whatever. Absolutely, and energy, energy. Energy. All right, the Simic deck. This is the one with Helm of the Host, probably, maybe? Oh, the, 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 art, the Commander art does have Helm of the Host on her. Yes, yes. Uh, this one's a little bit more underwhelming, and we were, like, really, really excited when they were talking about it in the video because they said we read the card, and we both said Ener everything, everything counter at the same time, and we were like, my mind was racing with, oh, my God, creatures are going to get, like, every like keyword ability yeah. that exists this is crazy no they're getting every creature type which is still very very strong uh you can also give lands and everything counter so omo queen of vesuva is a two and hybrid simic mana for a one five shapeshifter noble that whenever it enters the battlefield or attacks you put an everything counter on each of up to one target land and up to one target creature each land with an everything counter on it is every land type in addition to its other types, and then each non-land creature with an everything counter on it is every creature type. Note that they are only going to be that if the commander is on the battlefield. Yes. So these are not intrinsic counters that grant that ability. They are counters much like uh, much like an experience counter, where it doesn't really mean anything unless, unless you have something that's referencing an experience counter. Yep. Um, perfect mana fixing. If yeah. you get enough experience counters out and you've got Omo, uh, seems like it would be better in like a four or five color deck as just part of the 99 than yeah. a commander. Obviously, we don't know how it's built yet, though. Right. But 
it, it does uh, give Simic. Um, there are quite a few Simic cards that have Domain, mm-hmm. which says for each of each of the basic land types that you control, mm-hmm. you get to do a thing. Um, so that's pretty cool. However, it's only two color. Yeah. Which is which is probably the most limiting aspect of this deck. Uh, the backup commander, Jyoti Moag Ancient, is a two green blue. It costs two green blue for a two four elemental that when it enters the battlefield, you create a one one forced dryad land creature token for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. At the beginning of each combat, land creatures you control get plus X plus X until end of turn where X is Jyoti's power. So a much more straightforward sort of creature, hybrid creature land kind of play style. I think it's kind of insinuating what this deck is going to be a little bit. I feel like we're going to have a lot of land creatures. Yeah, the deck is, I believe, called, uh, what is it, Uh, uh, Tricky Terrain. Mm. So, yeah, that makes sense. So... Honestly, probably my uh, I've given it a little bit more thought since we've cleaned off our disgusting sweaty selves. Yes. Um, probably my least favorite of the four, I would say, though I think Omo would fit in a lot of four and five color decks just for smoothing things out. Yeah, I can see that. I can see um, even more so than Commander, I can see it becoming popular in other uh, internal formats mm-hmm. that, you know, the, that's a pretty good ability for a pretty low cross creature with a big butt. That is true. That is true. A 1-5. One 1-5. Five. One one five. Five. She's a big old booty. Big old booty. Big old booty. Big old booty. Then we have our graveyard deck in Jund. Disa the Restless. Two black, red, green for a 5-6 human scout. Whenever a Lurgoyf permanent card is put into your graveyard from anywhere other than the battlefield, you can put it onto the battlefield. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a Tarmogoyf token. Deal combat damage to a player means you can get up to three of these a turn cycle if you're attacking all the players. Or six if you have, they, all your creatures have double strike. Which would be a little bit un, unnecessary, but... <laughs> it'd be unhinged. It'd be very unhinged. For those of you that don't know, Tarmogoyf, uh, it's a star, one plus star green creature that it gets... Uh, its power and toughness are equal to the number of card types in graveyards, mm-hmm. and, then the, and then toughness, toughness is, is... One plus that. One plus that number. Uh, just so that, at worst case scenario, it's a zero one. Yes. So getting a lot of those tokens can be very, very powerful in Pretty a graveyard cool. strategy like this. Uh, she is backed up by Corum the Undertaker. For one black, red, green, you get a zero five human warrior. Uh, Corum the Undertaker gets plus X plus O, where X is the greatest power among creature cards in all graveyards. Whenever Corum attacks, each player mills a card, and then during one of each of your turns. You may play a land and cast a spell from among cards and graveyards that were put there from libraries this turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we either have the go wide strategy with the the with the Disa, mm-hmm. or we have the go tall strategy with Corum here. Um, honestly, Corum I think is the better of the two. I would agree. Um, Lurgoyfs, there's not a ton of them, and I imagine this deck's going to have quite a few of them yeah. just to get Disa online. But Corum is just kind of an all-around graveyard strategy, and he's not the threat of a graveyard deck. He's just kind of enabling all of the things that a mm-hmm. graveyard deck wants to do, getting the mill, uh, letting you play things from your graveyard without having to do big workarounds like some like Slimefoot and Squee, for yeah. example, of having to get Slimefoot into Slimefoot and Squee into the graveyard and then having mana and then having a a, a plant was it a plant a sapperling sapperling token to yeah. sacrifice on the battlefield to pull something out. A little bit more simple. Um, I would. I, a lot of people are are going a little crazy about Quorum right now. Oh, sure. are they? I haven't seen too much. I haven't looked into the discourse about Quorum. The Twitter the Twitter sphere is very pro Quorum uh, and also making a lot of WWE jokes because he's the, the Undertaker. Undertaker. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You know? I want that. I I want that uh, that proxy. <laughs> that proxy. <laughs> we need we need to hit up Tyler. <laughs> we need to hit up Tyler at the Proxy Forge about that. So, but between the four uh, commander decks that we are going to be getting out of this modern Horizon set. Which one is appealing to you the most after seeing these commanders? I, of course, I am a, a graveyard player at heart. Mm. Um, so if we were to sit down in a pot of four, I think the, either the graveyard one or, heck, the Eldrazi one. Just because that's... It's Eldrazi. It's Eldrazi. Yeah, I get it. Eldrazi is fun. I have, I have several decks that are in the wedge of blue, red, white. Mm-hmm. Energy counters... Don't really appeal to me, though. It seems like just another thing I need to keep track of that I'm not particularly fond of. Mm. 
So I would want to go the simplest route. And for me, that is Aslock. <laughs> Aslask, the Swelling Scourge. I would be doing the backup commander for the Eldrazi. Yeah, probably. that's fair. Just just make a ton of things. And it's like, all right, I have an experience. That's just one thing. I don't have to keep track of it. I don't have to spend it. It just is there. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just going to be big. Be big boy. Be big old Swelling Scourgey boy. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna let, let you do a little introspection here. But you often say that doesn't really interest me. I'm not really interested in that thing. And then you play it, and you're like, now nah, I'm into this. You did that with uh, the day night cycle for werewolves. You're like, werewolves are dumb when we first started. Yeah. And then you build a werewolf deck. You did that with uh, oh uh, the initiative. And now whenever the initiative comes down in your uh, in your Abdel Adrian deck, you're like, oh, I gotta do the initiative. It's more like I have to do the initiative because then I have to read what it is and then I have to do the thing. And I'm like, oh, all right, yeah, I'll get a basic land now, I guess. I gotta shuffle my fucking library now. Oh, okay, I'll make that token that I don't have a, a token for yet. <laughs> the best the, the best part about the the initiative is just the is just completing it and getting the ten off the top and being able to pull something. Anyway, anyway, that we're not here to talk about the initiative. We will talk about the rest of uh, the previews that we saw today. Yes. Today. And probably going to be talking about some things that are in the future from when we're recording this, just because they're really fucking cool. Uh, I want to talk about power balance a lot right now. So this is continuing a cycle that was started with counterbalance, which was a blue, blue enchantment. And whenever someone cast a spell, you could reveal the top card of your library. And if it was the same mana cost as that spell, it would counter it. Yes. With power balance... Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may reveal the top card of your library. If you do, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost if the two spells have the same mana value. I feel like this is way more powerful than Counterbalance, and Counterbalance is already really fucking powerful, yeah. as is. Um, this is probably the card I would love to pull the most. That's fair. Of the entire set, and that's a little bit crazy to me. Yeah. I mean, I think... Uh... I don't know. I've never I've never uh, played with counterbalance or seen it in play, but it's it's I a, can imagine it's a boogeyman right now in CDH. Like every time I see gameplay where someone's playing a counterbalance, the rest of the table like the rest of the table's groaning. It's now something they have to work around. Yeah, like it becomes a focal point problem and like a target for removal. I, and I imagine power balance is going to be the same. I imagine in, in lower power games and in, in regular EDH, it's not as much because uh, the the mana um, the mana costs of throughout a deck, all the decks are just so much more wild than mm -hmm. um, in CEDH and higher power games. I don't remember know if you remember any of the discourse when Talion, the Kindly Lord, came out, mm -hmm. and they were talking about okay, what is the best number to choose? It's probably two. It's probably two. And so I feel like, yeah, that this kind of has that same idea of, okay, anytime... Tell would counter this, yeah, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> or he would uh, draw you a card and ping yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, God, yeah. Uh, Italian does see some CDH play. Not a crazy Not amount. Not a crazy amount. It's just like a good... It's just like a general kind of good control measure against what other players are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, another color pip, color pip card. Uh, white, white for the White Orchid Phantom. This is a... a a little bit of a play on uh, the Knight of the White Orchid. He died. He died. He died. Uh, but now you have a 2-2 Spirit Knight with flying and first strike. When it enters the battlefield, you can destroy up to one target non-basic land, and his controller may search its library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then a shuffle. Yeah, we've been seeing a lot more cards in the last couple of sets, uh, and especially in this one. Obviously, in uh, in one-on-one -on -one formats, land destruction is a little more common mm -hmm. uh, than it is in EDH but we've been seeing a lot more of the of these destroy land usually go two drop for a basic of some sort, yeah. Um, yeah. controlling your the very powerful lands that are that are been printed in the you know past couple of years. Well, I mean, even even blowing up someone's command tower mm -hmm. is like a somewhat reasonable play. Yeah, honestly, uh, obviously blowing up like an Urborg or a Yavimaya or mm. a, a Gaia's Cradle or something yeah. like that yeah, yeah. really just swings advantage one way. The ball coffers Nix. Oh yeah, uh, Nix Nixos Nixos trying to Nix exactly. Um, right now, I'm going to talk about kind of a pseudo cycle of cards because it's not really a cycle of cards per se, but it's just kind of a trend of taking these these existing non creature spells. And then making them creatures. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I'm talking about the Trickster's Elf, which is Elk, 
sorry, Trickster's Elk, which is two and a green for a three three elk. That also has bestow one and a green. And when you use when you cast a first bestow, it enchants a creature. Uh, enchanted creature loses all abilities and is a green elk creature token with base power and toughness three three. Sadly, it doesn't draw you a card like uh, no, like the Kenrith transformation. Kenrith. But I love the flavor text on it. Wait. Is that our dad, Rowan Ro- Kenrith the Will? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, but I love I love the bestow mechanic from mm-hmm. Theros. I'm I'm nostalgic for it. From that's when I started playing Magic, and I took a very long break after that year. But the bestow mechanic in general, I find to be very powerful. The problem was that it was over cost, but for two mana, being able to elk a creature, yeah, elk a commander is powerful. And then if they find a way to remove their own commander or like use it as a blocker or something, you now have a three three elk as well. Yeah, it's a pretty so good rate. There's there's some good upside to that. Uh, the other one of note is the Serum Visionary, two and a green for a two two Vidalcan Wizard. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, then scry two, much like the 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 card Serum Vision. Mm-hmm. Where In uh, March of the Machine, there was also Serum Sovereign, mm-hmm. which is a Sphinx that had the activated ability of Sir of uh, yeah draw a card serum scry vision. two. Yep. Uh, this is on rate for the Serum Vision as well, though. So. Our serum version was one in a blue. Is uh, it one in a blue or two in a blue? I could look. I have it in a, in a deck. I don't, eh, know. I don't care. Next, I want to talk about a couple cycles of MDFCs that we are getting. Yeah. Yeah. So right now in front of us, we have Disciple of Fraelis. There's already several of these. They're larger, larger mana cost cards on one side. And then on their back side, they are a land that taps for one color and can enter the battlefield untapped if you pay three life. These cards are very, very fucking good. Yeah. Paying a couple of life to get something in untapped, is it going to be on power of a shock land? No, because it taps for one and it costs one more life to do. But these are being printed at uncommon. So these theoretically should be much more affordable. Mm -hmm. And... There's not really a deck building cost to them, right? Because in a lot of in a lot of instances, if oh, if I want to include if Disciple of Fraelis, for example, was just the creature card, it's like oh, do I cut do I cut a forest for it, or do I or do I want to keep my mana base good? Whereas you don't need to make that consideration because you can simply pay three life and have the land if you want the land and mm-hmm. need the land. So there really isn't a deck building cost, and including those kinds of MDFCs are very very powerful. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, there's another cycle of MDFCs that are uh, that are coming in in this set as well. Uh, so they are um, the dual lands on the backside. So uh, we've had the single color lands, mm-hmm. uh, several cycles of those. They enter uh, one side's a, a usually an instant or sorcery. The other side is a tapped uh, monocolor land. Now we're getting all ten of the. Uh, one side an instant sorcerer, or in some cases, or enchantment, and the other side a tapped dual land. Yeah, and having a tapped dual land in a lot of cases, even in higher power games, is more than acceptable. When you need the mana, you need you know when you need to keep ramping, keep your landfall going, you need that now. Yeah, you know? yeah, and just even even just being on curve with land drops, if you just happen to have a hand where it's like, all right, it's turn four, I need to make a land drop. Yeah. But I only need three mana this turn, and I don't need to hold up for anything. Then you can just have just having the tapped duel is going to be way better mm-hmm. than having to build some other fancy or way more expensive uh, version of that kind of an effect into your deck. The other kind of land cycle is a a non basic, non legendary land cycle that you're going to be able to tap them for one color, and they have threshold abilities yes. that are actually very very good or activated abilities for some of them as well uh we're looking at the barbarian ring right now which is tap to add a red barbarian rings deals one damage to you it also has threshold for red and tap you sack it it deals two damage to any target you can activate only if you have seven more cards in your graveyard uh we also had Ooh, are we gonna find it no we're not gonna find it very easily of course we're not gonna find it very easily um ooh, the 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 next big counter spell yes the next big one mana counter spell. So this is a play on Swan Song, which was a one mana instant to counter target enchantment, instant or sorcery spell, and then uh, the controller of that spell gets a two two bird. Yes. 
Now we have Strix Serenade. It is an instant for one mana. It also creates the controller of the spell that you are countering, a 2-2 bird, just like with Swan Song. But this time it counters target artifact, creature, or planeswalker instead of enchantment, instant, or sorcery. Yep. Um, there's a lot of people that are questioning whether or not this is going to be particularly powerful. I mean, I think it still hits a lot a for lot. one mana. You know, it's going to hit any any turn one uh, any turn one artifacts, mm-hmm. your mana, your mana crypt, your your soul ring, your uh, any any. It could also hit win cons like a thoracal coming down yeah. or something like that. I also want to say we're idiots because that uh, yes. the burning rage is a reprint, but there is a land cycle that we were. Oh, they didn't have threshold. What did they have? Shoot, shoot, shoot! I'm just scrolling through the list scrolling. right now. We're scrolling. We're scrolling. I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, it's never gonna show up. I mean, Urza's Cave's there, but that's not the one we're looking for. <laughs> Damn it. All right. There is a land cycle. We sound like yes. fucking idiots. But but we are getting some reprints of, like, Cephalid Colosseum, which is what Barbarians ring, ring and... Yes, of that it's cycle. That, it's that cycle. Okay. Uh, which I don't think... Oh, there's one card I want to talk about. The Emperor of Bones. Oh, my. It's one in a black for a 2-2 two, two, and Skeleton Noble. Not legendary. But at the beginning of combat on your turn, exile up to one target creature card from a graveyard. One in a black, adapt two. Whenever one or more plus one counters are put on Emperor of the of Bone, put a creature card exiled with it onto the battlefield under your control with a finality counter on it. Finality counter means that if it dies, it goes into exile instead of the graveyard. It gains haste, sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. So, um... It's a lot of text for two mana. It's a lot of text for two mana. A lot of text for two mana. But uh, yeah, that comes. You know, it, I don't like it. You shouldn't get it. <laughs> I think I should get like <laughs> seven. Yeah, literally, I know. I know how you play magic. You vile, loathsome, evil little cockroach. I know how you play magic. I'm gonna eat your graveyard. Yeah, no, that's that one. <sighs> yeah, eating the graveyard, getting the token copies, two mana, so you get it early. You're able to put one one counters on it for two mana. Two one one counters, yeah, for two mana. So it always stays at least on the grizzly bear scale of mana cost to power toughness. Mm-hmm. Even as you're dumping more mana into it, I don't, I don't like you. <laughs> uh, amped Amped Raptor is another one that is getting a little bit of conversation, particularly with its combo potential with Satya from the Jeskai Commander, ener- the Energy Commander deck. Uh, it's a one in red, two one dinosaur with first strike. When it enters the battlefield, you get two energy counters. Then, if you cast it from your hand, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non land card. You may cast that card by paying an amount of uh, energy counters equal to its mana cost value rather than paying its mana cost. Uh, this, in combination with Satya creating the copies, uh, They're going to be entering the battlefield. You don't need to pay for them to keep them around, but instead of getting two energy for every time you're getting that ability with Satya, if you're copying the Amped Raptor, you're getting four energy because it itself is generating two energy and getting you that Cascade. So every single time you copy it, you will then be able to effectively be getting a Cascade for the next non-land card, and if it is four or less mana, you'll be able to cast it. Uh, If you cast it from your hand, you get the Cascade. Oh, that's right. That's right. You're still getting the energy counter. Yeah. Damn it. I like. I don't like wording. Right next to it is the Warren uh, Warren Soul Trader. I've also seen some people talking about how combo potential this is. It's a zombie goblin wizard three three. All all relevant creature types, uh, and you can. It has an activated ability. Pay one life and sacrifice another creature. Create a treasure token. Mm-hmm. 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 No tapping. No, no tapping. tapping. Doesn't say non token. Doesn't say once per turn. Yeah, that can go that can go infinite as long as you have a way to gain life off of it or just a massive reservoir of life you can create a ridiculously large amount of mana. Um, Anything that creates treasure tokens via activated ability that is cheap is going to it's going to be a little fucky. Oh yeah. Um there was one there's a couple other things. Uh did we ever talk about Harbinger of the Seas on a podcast? We did not. So this is kind of like a blood moon, except it's for islands and it's on a creature. So it's one blue blue for a two two Merfolk wizard, and then all or non basic lands are islands. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of non basic land hate in this set in particular. Even just lately we've been getting a lot of them. Yeah. Which I am all for. 
very much for actually just because the amount of powerful lands is starting to get out of control I, I also, you know, there's plenty of people, you know, uh, uh, other podcasters who I listen to and YouTube people who are like, hmm, well, then, of course, very, you know, like higher level power. It's like, I only run one basic in this deck. There, it, well, if, if you know, you, we're destroying your land, so better go find it. Go, I want to put another one so you can make sure to tutor. Exactly. And if you're getting into three plus colors, it is very feasible to build a very solid mana base that has zero basics in it. Oh, yeah. And in fact, you're needing to cut other non-basic lands to make room for better non-basic lands. And just getting your land count down because you're starting to be efficient with all the fetches and yeah. stuff. So I feel like this is just kind of in response to that a little bit. Just giving more tools for basic for non-basic land hate. Mm -hmm. uh, and encouraging people to kind of chill out their mana bases a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of... Uh... There, there's that's been a problem uh, that I've, I've, you know, kind of run across in my recent deck building, and I've seen a lot of people talk about where it's like, you don't get a lot of encouragement over the past couple of years to play monocolored, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with the amount of land cycles that have been coming out, with, you know, all the all the powerful multi or uh, the powerful other lands that are coming out. It's like, well, okay, here's a reason to play some monocolor. Oh, all my all my non basics are islands. Too bad I only have mountains. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one other cycle. Big cycle in this set. Big. Very big cycle. This is the flare cycle. So this is... These are cards that... They, they've done these kinds of cycles before. They did them with the... Um, the force of cycle yeah and then in modern and then there was also the um evoke the, the free evoke. evoke yes the exile evoke which are getting which both of them or no the evoke creatures are getting uh reprinted yeah. in retro frame in this set as well but flare the flare of cycle is another cycle of instance and in, uh instance that give you an option to cast them for free mm -hmm. this time instead of pitching a card from your hand into exile you now have to sacrifice a non-token creature of the color of the spell rather than pay its mana cost. And some of these effects are very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. You have the green one where you basically just get a cultivate. Yeah. Which, I mean, I think, I think, I think tapping, floating a Lana War Elves uh, green mana and then sacking it to cultivate is more than acceptable. Yeah. Very good rate. You have the counterspell version, which is one blue blue which is a better counter spell rate than a force of will yeah uh the it's a little bit harder to get the free version uh flare of duplication is the red one that get, lets you copy an instant or sorcery flare of malice is probably the shittiest one uh each opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker the greatest mana value among creatures and planeswalkers they control and then white is probably one of the better ones if not the best one just a protection effect until end of turn life totals cannot your life total cannot change permanence you control gain hexproof and indestructible Here's what I will say. So, obviously, um, Flare of Duplication. All right, that's got its places. Yeah, the uh, the green one, whatever that was, because uh, we're not looking directly at it. It's got its places. The blue one, like you were saying, it's easier to just cast, just a hard cast. And it's like, okay, if I have this as the as the only counter spell in my hand and I have man up, fine. If you're doing your thing that's going to win the game, I don't care about, you know, my value piece isn't going to be valuable once the game is over. Exactly. Um even even your own combo win con if it's to stop someone else's yeah. that is comboing off then that's like at that point your resources mean nothing if the game's going to be over after this exactly play. and so, sometimes those combo win pieces come down their trigger goes on the stack doesn't mm -hmm. matter if they're still on the battlefield yeah um, so you need to get rid of them before they enter mm -hmm. is the thing flare of fortitude same idea if I'm going to lose the game right now, I need to stop that so I can try to win the game next turn. Yeah, right now. <laughs> Flare of Malice, I will say, is kind of the least um, the least versatile and at least maybe least powerful option. But, uh, you know, Black already runs Fleshbag Marauder, mm -hmm. where it's, I believe it's also four mana. It comes down, each player sacrifices a creature. Yeah. So, and this this is also going to go well in decks that are wanting your opponents to sacrifice and discard to get various triggers off. So, mm -hmm. it's going to have a home. It will definitely have a home. Uh, just not with me. We do, of I'll course, take three. <laughs> I'll take four. I'll take a playset, please. Oh God. Also, uh, the pre the pre uh, pre order prices, the pre drop prices for those ones in particular are don't 
ridiculous. Yeah, they'll they'll calm down for sure. Uh, just a couple rapid fire things here. Genku, Future Shaper. Uh, this is the husband of Tamio. He creates unique tokens that are uh, their children, mm-hmm. effectively. A 2-2 white fox with vigilance, a 1-2 blue moon folk with flying, and a 1-1 black rat with lifelink. Um, I, saw, I saw a funny tweet that was like, that was like, oh, this creates a lot of cool tokens. And then someone responding with, yeah, the, canonically those are their those are their children. And then it showed him being like crosses out crosses out word on a piece of paper, and it was Azorius aristocrats. <laughs> <laughs> so so no no sacrificing the wee children here. Uh, we also got six, which is the tree half of Ren and six. Yeah, also a very high pre order price because I mean graveyards giving every giving non-land permanents in your graveyard retrace and uh uh when it attacks milling cards and letting you pull hands back to your hand that's pretty good yeah for, for three, three mana. mana three mana two four three mana and it's got reach so you know big old booty blocker and then of course the mog mob we took three mog goblins shoved them together you now got a mob of them red 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 for a three three you can sack it to deal three damage divided amongst one two or three targets pretty good it's a good meme it's a great meme even it's a it's a fine meme (laughs) it's a meme it is it is a (laughs) meme uh and we would be remiss not to mention the eldrazi titans yes uh the the three biggins we've we saw elmer cool a couple weeks ago now we have ulamog the defiler i want to get to ulamog second because he's the more fucky one we have kozilek (laughs) the broken reality nine mana nine nine eldrazi when you cast this spell up to two target players each manifest two cards from their hands each for each card manifested this way you draw a card and then other colorless creatures you control get plus three plus two just a very straightforward chill eldrazi as far as high mana value eldrazis go yeah manifesting's fine if you're manifesting a creature you're not really going to be able to cheat things unless you are in gruel colors and you can get a uh, yaris roar the old gods onto the battlefield i feel like this would go good as a top end card in yaris yeah i mean also you know you you just get to uh, drop two uh two cards face down these are two two colors creatures okay well now suddenly they're five fours yeah with kozilek they are big so big threats so yeah, as, as long as you're as long as you're one of the players that gets target that you choose to target for this ability when it enters the battlefield you're probably going to be drawing four cards and putting onto the battlefield what's nine plus five plus 19 power onto the battlefield for nine mana yeah that's that's a good rate that's hard to beat that is it's hard to get to but it's hard to beat it's hard to get to but it they're going to run out of really cool, big, flashy abilities for Eldrazi at some point, right? Right now. Right now, with Ulamog, the Defiler. <laughs> a 10-mana 7-7. Seven, seven. When you cast this spell, target opponent exiles half their library rounded up. Ward, sacrifice two permanents. Ulamog, the Defiler, enters the battlefield with a number of plus one, plus one counters on it, equal to the greatest mana value among cards in exile. Ulamog has Annihilator X, where X is the number of plus one, plus one counters on it. Yeah. Thank God that this isn't combined with uh, Aslask yeah. and then just giving everything Annihilator X for X is the number. Creating token copies of them, though. Ignoring the legend rule. Which, I mean, in the five color Eldrazi deck, plenty of options. Plenty well, of options. I don't know in the deck, but you can build you can, in. You can build You, you can build, build in. in, yeah. But even just entering. Target opponent exiles half of their library. That's you can't unless you can stifle that. There's yeah, it's happening as soon as they cast it. As soon, even if they counter it, the they all drop like that in and of itself can ruin someone's chances of coming back in a game mm-hmm. or or thwarting what you're doing ultimately. Ward sacrifice two permanence is a big cost just to even target Ulamog once it is on the battlefield, and if you're exiling some half of someone's library. Worst case scenario, mm-hmm. three plus one plus one counters. Yeah. Meaning once it's on the battlefield, you have a 10 mana 10 10 with Annihilator three and Ward sacrifice two permanents and you exiled half of someone's library. Mm-hmm. And that's not even counting if you had like Kozilek come down earlier and they had to get rid of it with a source to plowshare mm-hmm. or something like that. Well, now that's a nine nine and that's a nine mana uh, thing in oh, or nine nine in fuck. exile. That's 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 plus nine counters, so that's a total of, of sixteen power, toughness, and annihilator 
nine. I would I would like to I would like to also point out the various uh, the evoke creatures, the free spells that require you to pitch things to exile. You can pitch big things to exile. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if it's the opponent that you target to exile half their library. Ooh, combine this with Urza's cave. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You have to exile. You can, you can tap for two mana if you've exile. If when it comes down, you exile a uh, creature with seven CMC or colorless creature with seven CMC or higher. And then you can get it back. Yeah. And Ulamog won't care once you get it back. He's yeah. got the counters on him. Yeah, once he... And, proliferate. There's a million ways to even just get counters on things oh, yeah. later. Like, yeah. Ulamog's... Scary. There's a reason it's pre-order price $75. Yeah. Um... I don't have anything else that I really want to to mention. We've talked about we've talked about Kudo, the King Among Bears, before. We've seen Never, Nethergoyf, the Winter Moon. Uh, obviously, obviously, hello to the Worm Coil Larva. Yeah, <laughs> mini Worm Coil Engine. But uh, do you have anything you want to say about Modern Horizons Three right now? I can't wait to see which cards get banned where. I imagine the Dog Umbra one is going to get banned in Popper. You think so? Yeah. Yeah pretty versatile yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a relevant creature to, or it's a relevant uh, card type yeah and they got rid of uh totem armor they changed the name to umbra armor which umbra. is just kind of more thematic for yep uh totem armor switched to umbra armor and uh kindred or uh, uh tribal switched to kindred this set mm-hmm. yep i mean it's 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 way too versatile it's got flash it's two mana you can either lock someone else's creature down or give one of your things effectively uh, a shield counter yeah so Anyway, that is all that we have to say about Modern Horizons 3. We're now going to wrap up this episode of the Duels of Mana Dorks podcast. We're going to talk about Game Informer. They released an article talking about D&D specifically. They showed off the cover art for the player's handbook. You get to see the party fighting a pair of dragons. And then they showed the back cover as well, where the said party in classic D&D fashion Mm -hmm. is then riding on the back of the dragon with the exception of the one character that already had flight and is choosing to fly alongside the dragon instead of doing the cool thing. They had fly. They they might as well spend it. Might as well. Might as well. I mean, that's just classic D and D stuff. Uh, the bigger thing here that's more interesting for our purposes is the return to D and D's most classic setting. Yes. In the original D and D from Gary Gygax, the original setting of D and D Greyhawk is now going to be the setting of the Dungeon Master's Guide. This is the first time since they moved to the Forgotten Realms in fourth edition that we have been back to Greyhawk in a meaningful way. They've been adapting a lot of the Greyhawk adventures in new forms for fifth edition, but now we're actually going to be getting a proper return to this very classic plane kind of it, it seems more it seems very like a thematic kind of reset for D. yeah since this was supposed to be the or is supposed to be the the ultimate mm-hmm. the ultimate edition of D. uh yeah sure let's make let's go let's go yeah. back to greyhawk why not love it love it uh game informer really really great article they got the exclusive which i find interesting you know there's all these there's all these tabletop gaming websites and such Leave the, leave the bugs that are flying in the room alone. The bugs need to leave me alone. That's... you stinky boy. I'm, stinky, I'm not, we stinky mopped inky, off. Stinky, inky boy. Yeah, we did mop off because we were so stinky. <laughs> it's totally not two days later. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, we've got the MTG ban list. Banned and list restricted amount announcements from May 13th. There are two big ones. Uh, all Eternal Formats are no longer going to be able to play any cards that create attractions or bring a sticker deck into the game. So basically, Unfinity is banned in internal formats. Uh, Commander is the only thing it's legal now, I believe. Yes, yes. So the the biggest reason for that was it, re- it required a lot of extra deck building work mm-hmm. for pretty much anyone that played those formats because there are a lot of effects like a phantasmal image that can copy other players' valuable creatures or that like a gilded drake that can swap them and something as prevalent as blank goblin. Mind where, goblin. These nuts. Uh, where you can take a sticker and you put a sticker on it and mm-hmm. then it creates a whatever it is goblin and then you get an amount of mana equal to the number of vowel, different vowels. Unique vowels, yeah. And and just looking quickly through, because uh, for constructed you had to have bring 10 of them and start the game with three random ones. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, very easy. It's a. It was a very playable card because of that. How how easily you could net mana. It was a good ritual. Um, and the designers were like, "Yeah, we really 
didn't ex- we like tried to make them weak. We tried to make it so that only commander players would want to play yeah. with stickers and attractions. Uh, but that that they missed that one. They missed. And the thing was is even if you weren't running those cards, you still needed to have a sticker deck and an attraction deck if you were playing against decks that would be running those kinds of cards Mm -hmm. simply because you wouldn't be able to utilize them with the various very rampant and very popular copy and stealing effects that you would be able so you wouldn't if you got the card you wouldn't be able to do anything with it yeah because you wouldn't have any stickers to put on it you wouldn't have any attractions to pull in Uh, and because of all of that added complexity and it just wasn't what they were intending with the design of those cards they're just like full ban on all of them Every single one. Not to mention the physical aspect of the stickers was oh starting God. to fail. Which I mean, two There's year, two years later, but not surprising. But like, there's, there's stickers. They're uh, <laughs> they're an adhesive on a piece of plastic. And you very easily could have just been like, I'm using that one and not actually use the sticker. So I get it. it. It's it. There's a. I wasn't a fan of these kinds of cards anyway. So. I'm think, fine with it. I think that stickers were a, a little too much. I liked the idea of attractions because the attractions effectively were, you know, if we had a card that said, when you play this card, create a legendary token that says at the beginning of your uh, uh, combat, roll a die. If you roll a six, you get your creatures get plus one, plus oh until end of turn. That's effectively like the extent of what the attractions were. Yeah. But yeah, with having them in an extra deck. It's still, it was. It turned out to be a little too much. Yeah. And now the one that breaks your heart. Yeah, the one that was a little bit too much for for the the cheap stakes, cheap stakes and scallywags and and gutter rats of the of the popper format. I say those terms with endearment, as I as I would like to be one of you one day. All that glitters, appropriately not appropriate for popper, simply on the art because it creates a lot of it, the art has a lot of gold coins in it. But all that glitters uh, has been banned. All that glitters was a one. It is. It's not banned in everything. It's just banned in popper. <laughs> they did be, not destroy God, every copy of the card ever. I would be furious if it got banned in everything. It would. For one, there would be no reason for it. And two, oh, I God. like the card a lot. Yeah. It, yeah. No. It's fine. This. It's a, fi- it's a great card. It is a great card. It is a great card. All that glitters. One in a white for an enchantment aura. Enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus one plus one for each artifact and or enchantment you control. The. They were talking about this back when they banned Monastery Swift Spear in December mm-hmm. already as something they were looking into. And it was very, very easy in Popper to run things like an Ornithopter, a zero cost artifact creature, or a Ginger Brute, which was a one cost artifact creature that gives them evasion of some kind. And then a turn two, all that glitters, onto a turn three, all that glitters, and then suddenly you're hitting for lethal on turn three, somewhat consistently. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were starting to build, people were starting to build decks specifically to counter all that glitters, not even just sideboarding in options. And it just kind of was starting to warp the entire format around it, so I get it. Yeah, sideboarding is one thing, but uh, and if you were running white, it was like, well, I kind of have to. I kind of have to run all that glitters. It was was too good, because even with just all that glitters in play, it's a Mm 1-1. It's plus 1, plus 1 for 2 mana, which isn't crazy. Even if it was, I had a Ginger Brute and all that glitters. Uh, it's plus two, plus two. Makes Ginger Brute a three, three. You can throw another mana on and make it whatever. The once you get the second one, yeah. Once you get the other zero cost artifacts out with your ornithopters. Once you get your one mana things out, get your rocks out, your exactly. your mind stone, yeah. Then artifact lands, even, yeah, were being run, and it was getting way too out of control. There's there's very easily a situation where you were playing. Um, the white artifact land you play that ornithopter you tap it for a ginger brute yeah turn two another one of the or another artifact land of any kind tap it all that glitters you now have plus five plus five on whatever you just put it on it yeah so either the flying evasive thing or the thing that's going to be a little bit stronger and then get evasion then if you throw down another land even if it's not an artifact and you can slap down another ornithopter and then another all that glitters like it it spirals out of control way too fast for popper and in popper is also a format you can generate infinite mana and have infinite combos and win still and yeah. all that glitters is getting banned because it's that strong um 
We hardly knew you. I mean, it's been around since Throne. So, yeah. It's been around for a while. But it's a very good card. It's a very good card. Highly recommend playing it. If you're if you're looking for powerful enchantment auras and you're in white, highly recommend if you do not know anything about all the glitters. But that is all we have. Um, in the previous version of the podcast we recorded where the audio was all bad, we talked about some Bloomborough plushies that you can get, little keychain plushies of various... Fibble tip. Yeah, you can get Fibble tip. You can get some cute creatures. We also saw Jace the Mind Sculptor is getting yeah. reprinted as a fox version. Foxy in Jace. Blo- oh, Ooh. Foxy, J- Foxy Jace. Highly recommend getting the uh, the starter decks for Bloomborough because you're guaranteed a Bria Riptide, the otter that gives everything prowess, and that's a good card, and it'll probably be... In general, we're fans of the starter decks. Oh, yeah. They're very inexpensive and, and very good value. Yeah. And they're, Just, I mean, they're ready to go out of the box. You can mm-hmm. crack them, play, mm-hmm. with, play a couple games with them, mm-hmm. and then if, take the pieces. Exactly. Check check the deck lists. If it seems like something that's in, that interests you, if you see the value in it, or you see yourself, you, you can see yourself using the cards, it's a, it's a fairly good investment. Or you could just keep it on your shelf, and it'll be fun to just bust out with someone that barely knows anything about magic. It's a great time. But... We will end this episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, as we always do, by taking questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the audience. The best way to do that is to submit them onto our Patreon thread, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros. Every week, every other week when we are recording the podcast, we're going to put a podcast thread up several days before we record the podcast. You can put any of your questions there. We'll give a little bit of insight about the kind of stuff we're talking about. You could be magic. It could be d d You could be telling us we're fucking idiots. You could be telling us we're pretty and you want to kiss Sam's face. If you want to, please tell him that. But... Let me know. Down in the comments. But we have two inquiries this week from the Patreon. First one is from Brandon asking, should there even be a ban list and what cards do you think should be on the ban list or taken off of the ban list? Uh, we're going to talk from the commander perspective simply mm-hmm. because that is the format that we play the most. Yes. Um, and I think we were both in agreement that there absolutely needs to be a ban list. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot. I mean, the the idea of the ban list is not to is very different than other formats. Other formats, the ban list is here. We are giving you guidelines to make sure that each of the prevalent archetypes is or the prevalent strategies is playable. Yeah. In commander, it's this is supposed to be a fun, casual, and um, robust format that lets you play anything. So the 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 committee, the rules committee, has been very judicious with banning only cards that are of a caliber that ruin the game. Yeah, um, and not even that like deadlock the game. They deadlock. They kind of go against the design philosophy of Commander as a format. Yeah. So the ones that come to mind for me are Conspiracy and Anti. Mm -hmm. Like that stuff was immediately banned for Commander and it just kind of, it doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't work with the format. Uh, There, obviously you can't, you need to ban certain super powerful cards that don't have a wide level of accessibility, like the Power Nine, for example, because they're too good and they lock out anybody that can't afford them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Black Lotus is stupid expensive. Even the the various moxes, the yeah. free mana rocks, way too expensive. So those kinds of things need to be banned. In terms of cards that we would ban or unban, there there have been some card like um, oh, what is it? It's not Goto. It's Gol- uh, Golos. Golos. I don't think that needs to be banned anymore. Yeah, I think at the time it was banned because it was kind of killing the five color commander scene because it was, I mean, it's not a particular, it, when it enters the battlefield, you get to tutor for a land. It might even be a, a specifically a forest land. Um, otherwise, it just has an act five color activated ability that lets you start going off the top of your deck and finding cards. Um, we had plenty of cards do that. Yeah. However... It was like, well, why would anybody play any th- other five color commander at that point? Um, at that point. At, at that point. Since then, we've gotten things like Joda the Unifier. Uh, we've got things like uh, the Sliver Hive Mother. Is that the- uh, several slivers. Yeah. Several sli- slivers. One of them lets you tutor for other slivers. Yeah. And just pull them. So we're about to have Ulalek. Ulalek. You're going to have Ulalek, which is going to be fucking busted. Uh, Aslask is going to be very strong. Like, there's a lot of great five-color options, and it seems like that's kind of... It seems like it was an early ban when they were still trying to figure out Mm -hmm. Commander as a format and what they wanted to do with it. Yeah. Uh, Because that that ban was the one that 
to me stands out because it's like how other formats ban things and that's ultimately not the philosophy they ended up going with uh, there are there's a lot of talk about people banning certain staples in the commander format be they mana crypt soul ring uh, uh like ristic studies mystic remora orcish bowmasters dockside extortionist that kind of stuff i don't necessarily agree with that i think that of all the ones you listed um obviously if they pay soul ring is the opposite of the power nine list where it's like it's good it's great it's a very it's a very good card uh but it's so accessible and we want it beyond an infinite it's very good and we want everyone to have it yeah pretty so much. they made it they basically made it so that you can't not easily get a soul ring it comes in every commander pre-con and you, it's um, reprinted constantly it's just massively in circulation uh i think that the a lot of hate i know a lot of hate obviously for orcish bowmasters but i think that dockside extortionist is one of those that a lot of people hate for the reason that it's hard to um it's hard to see it coming and when it does come because it's so easy to get by it just kind of warps the the individual play session that you're in mm. Um, and there are very few cards that aren't like in the command zone already or that aren't like, I'm going to have to tap all of my mana to do this thing. Whereas Dockside is like, I tap two and there's a Dockside. And I think that's why a lot of people, and then obviously now you have, with the prevalence of enchantments and, and, and artifacts, now you have a lot more mana than before. And it's hard to overcome once somebody has that. Yeah, I would I would argue that if we're going to use that logic to ban Dockside Extortionist, then you're going to need to use that logic to ban a lot of other cards because all he is doing is giving you mana advantage. Well, again, and temporary mana advantage at that. I would argue that a Gaius Cradle or a Nyxos Shrine to Nyx is going to be way more of a problem than a Dockside Extortionist, and that comes at simply land drop. There's like mm. no cost associated with it. Yeah, but you board wipe and suddenly your guy cradle, your guy's cradle is no use. Um, but I will say they do have the the command the the banning the rules committee when they ban again. The, if you over if you overload a vandal blast, then your treasures are useless. Hmm. But uh, yeah. they never want to ban all Psych cards <laughs> of a of a type. They want to ban the specific problem cards. No, not even that. Just the the apex, the archetype, or the 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 face of that archetype of cards that is the problem like hull breacher uh hull breacher was a is a merfolk pirate i believe that when the opponent draws a, if an opponent would draw a card instead you create a treasure token mm -hmm. it's hard you know there are plenty of things that if you don't have the answer in hand you can't answer it mm -hmm. that locks the game i don't think dockside locks the game well I no think it swings favor yeah but I'm saying there's plenty of cards that swing favor. Yeah, and I think if we're going if we're going to ban Dockside, then it's suddenly like we're opening the door of what cards swing favor more. But again, we're not necessarily trying to ban all of those cards. Not immediately. We're just looking at which cards. We're just saying this, uh, which cards might be the face of mm -hmm. that possible issue. I, I think also Dockside doesn't need necessarily help as much in lower power games. Not at all. I've not I've, at all. When we've played some, I've had we have uh, dockside proxy forges. Mm -hmm. uh, great, and they're lovely, beautiful cards. Check them out, proxyforge.com. Put them in some decks, and I've had them. And the I've been, proxy forge. The proxy forge, and I've been like, we've been playing. It's like, all right, I would get. I could play, but it would be actually at mana disadvantage. Yeah, I would get. <laughs> I would get one. Tri I would get equal mana for this. Yeah. Like, it's very prevalent in CDH. Absolutely. And because of that, people see it as a boogeyman. But if they were yes. playing it in their regular pods, like, it's going to generate, what, four treasures? Mm -hmm. Five That's treasures? That's another thing. It's like, with the ban list, it's like, how are we going to affect this high power part of the format? Yeah. And I think if it's something, if we're looking at bans from cards that are good in cedh are not necessarily good in casual. And mm -hmm. I think if this is a casual format, then we need to make bans based on the casual format version of the format and dockside's not that boogeyman for casual or at least it shouldn't be in my mind i'd be more concerned about a ragavan in casual personally but <laughs> that's just me i mean ragavan's really strong first couple of turns mm -hmm. doesn't do much later in the game yeah. and dockside's doesn't do much in the first couple of turns and then unless you're much... unless you're playing in a game unless you're playing in a power level where it's like 
zero drop, zero drop, zero drop rocks. Yeah, yeah, if, you're yeah, doing, yeah. if you're doing a fetch land and a jeweled lotus and a mana crypt and a soul ring, and that's just kind of how your pod goes, then like, then you're probably at the, you're probably at the power level. You're probably at the game the gameplay level where it's like, okay, we can deal with this. Yeah, everybody that, has the dock side. Yeah, at that point, you're pushing the limit of what commander is in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, then the orcish bowmasters. I I. Uh, yeah, the other day when when we were all sweaty and we couldn't we couldn't yeah we couldn't record release yeah, that yeah, yeah. now yeah we uh, fried the computer because we were so sweaty you were you were pointing out uh, uh, kind of what the point of the orcish bowmasters is and I definitely agree mm-hmm. which is the punishment of the card draw yes specifically the the running rampant of effects like your mystic remora your esper sentinel ristic study those things give a massive card advantage to the player that controls them and orcish bow masters for one etb trigger flash so you're able to immediately take advantage of someone else's extra card draw even cards like ponder Mm -hmm. and uh, gataxian probe is another common one and being able to punish people for tra- for drawing too many cards is a counter to these other powerful cards that people are running a lot that people fear. Like, people fear a Ristic study that resolves yeah. and isn't dealt with immediately. So those kinds of cards, while Orcish Bowmasters is really, really powerful, because it its sheer existence is a counter to another powerful card, I feel like that makes them both less powerful and both more valid to not be banned yes. in a way. See, I also think that it comes down to people who are uh, playing at a lower power level or are newer to the game when deck building or when trying to play. It's like, you look at Rhystic Study and you're like, I get I get that it's good to draw cards, but I also want to play my cool thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's... It, you know, if so, when you're not understanding the 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 power of card draw itself, that the orc bone masters suddenly becomes like, well, now I I can't even do the one you know the one for turn that I get now if you know, I'm not without something in my small getting destroyed, getting hit in the face for. I like orcish bone masters. I really love orcish bone masters a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, then what do we want to ban in Commander? Because I only have really one card in mind. Good. That's the Dranath Magistrate. Yeah. One and a white. Players cannot cast spells from outside their hand. Uh, I don't know if you know this about the Commander format, but the Commanders are in the Command Zone, not your Dude. hand. Yeah. So uh, turn two, sometimes easily turn one... If you've got if you've got fast enough mana, mm-hmm. a turn one or a turn two Dranith Magistrate just locks the board out from playing Commander. Yeah, with a Commander. <laughs> so for that reason alone, I would want it banned. Uh, it is powerful in CEDH. I don't think it's like game warping. I think it just saps the fun of what the format is yeah. in a way. And uh, oh, there was another one that like locked out the command zone or something. Oh, that's the same reason they banned Oko. Oh yeah, because Oko with his with his yeah his elking ability would just turn off other people's commanders, and then you just have this dead card on board that is supposed to be like the centerpiece of your deck in a way. And since you can do it every turn, buffing Oko up as opposed to like uh, what is that card? Dark Steel Mutation. Yeah, that's that's a sing that's targeted removal. Yes. So targeted removal, fine. Board wide changing of what the format is or repeatable is is more problematic to me so that'd be the only thing i would ban i think we should ban the basic island mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. fuck blue yeah yeah that'd be really bad when they play that uh that merfolk that makes everything islands and then suddenly because you're playing a banned card you forfeit the game <laughs> <laughs> that'd be wild uh, that'd be awesome oh man thank you brandon for that question brandon our first paid patron for the patreon brandon thank you thank you brandon you're wonderful you're amazing uh, next, we've got a question from Sweeney's Girlfriend Archive that says, what properties would you like to see come to Magic? I think Mad Max would be cool. Uh, yeah, 
Bad Max would be very cool, especially with like a des- some desert mm-hmm. sub themes going on. Get some more stuff with that. I think they could be cool commander decks. I'm kind of more a fan of commander decks or like specific products as opposed to sets. Uh, obviously, I got my set that I really want with Lord of the Rings. Yeah, you did. And you're and we got Final Fantasy coming up, and, mm-hmm. and then Marvel coming up. Oh, the Mar- I'm not very excited for the Marvel set, honestly. I get that it's going to be big and make a lot of money, but it's just like we'll have to see once they start printing cards or once they start previewing cards in yeah. a year and a half. Yeah, I like I like how they've been doing uh, with like oh we're in Brothers War where there's a lot of artifacts. Here's some Transformers cards that you can pull from packs. Mm-hmm. Um, or like the Doctor Who Commander decks, the Fallout decks. Yeah, I'm be- I'm a big fan of the deck style, uh, uh, pre or the precon style mm-hmm. universes beyond, as opposed to just find them randomly in packs. It really lets you choose when you want to interact with the property. Yeah. At least at the beginning, obviously, once the cards are released, people see, oh, these are powerful. These have some pretty powerful cards, and they become prevalent. Absolutely. Um, you. You have a property that you love that is very, yes. very perfect for magic in terms of like themes. The Soulsborn series and Elden Ring, mm-hmm. uh, many of these FromSoft, the FromSoft Dark Fantasy series. Series is is. Series is is. Siri. Siris. Yeah, uh, uh, we were talking about it, and we, you know, you could bring it back. A lot of cool mechanics, like the backgrounds and the classes, you could kind of bring in there from. Uh, New new versions of those from which were originally printed in the in the D and D sets. Obviously, we also love D and D. Um, I also was thinking maybe not for a full set, but maybe for like a secret layer. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, 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 oh, now I'm blanking. Bioshock. Ah, yeah, yeah. Bioshock's Bioshock's one of those cult classic kind of properties, and obviously, I feel like we lean more towards the. Um, the video game side of things. We, yeah, absolutely. I feel like those are a bit easier to access from a licensing standpoint in t- for making secret layers. Mm-hmm. Uh, or not secret, uh, for Universes Beyond, yeah. which can be secret layers also. But also, like the Princess Bride secret layer, I think was also very cool. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Those kinds of smaller drops. Um, I'm a big Kingdom Hearts fan, so I wouldn't mind some Kingdom Hearts. That would be literally impossible because it's effectively owned by Disney. And they've got Lorcana, but so, so, there's also been some Disney stuff, so it's like I'll say so is Marvel, but yeah, yeah. The, with it is it is animated, so they want they keep the they they're that was the thing with Marvel as we heard is they wanted to keep the animated things for Lorcana and they'll mm. throw they'll throw Marvel to us yeah us here in the Magic World yeah I, but I could totally see like a little I could see a deck built around Kingdom Heart like a pair of decks of like the uh, Dark and Light. And you got, like, Sora, and you got, like, fucking Xehanort. Mm. And it's all Kingdom Hearts characters. And, like, the Xehanort deck can have, like, the Organization 13, like, some Heartless and stuff. And then you can have, like, uh, uh, a lot of the Kingdom Hearts-specific characters that are on the side of light. And it could be... I think it could be fun. But I'm, I'm kind of... Maybe one elite. of the Commander decks for uh, for the Fallout... Or, no, for the Final Fantasy set. That'd be cool. That would be fun. That would be fun. That would be a fun way to reprint some of the Final Fantasy cards as well if they if they wanted to, or like early preview and then have, later have it reprinted or like evolved upon in the Final Fantasy. So that would be pretty cool. And then I, uh, I'm a we're Harry Potter kids, right? Sure, yeah. Grew up I, watching them, read I the would, books. I would love a Harry Potter style, like Strixhaven coat of paint. You know? Yeah. Why not? That would be fun. Strixhaven's basically just Harry Potter anyway. <laughs> it, it kind of is, yeah. It has, it has the flavor. It's got a lot of the flavor. I mean, with, like, the the various schools of Matt. Like, it, it's a whole thing. But thank you, Sweeney's Girlfriend Archive, for that question. That is all the time that we have. Normally, we also would check the TikTok Live questions, but uh, we're not live. We're TikTok dead. We're, we're doing a pickup right now. So that's what they call it in the biz, is a pickup. And now we're doing a put down. Now we're doing a put down. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this, this Lord's 67th episode <sighs> of... That oh, fuck, that's right. We are getting close. Shit. We got two episodes to figure something stupid out. It's equivalent uh, to one month in real time. Shit. Shit. Let us know down in the comments what we should do uh, for, for, the, for the episode. You the know. episode. You know. The episode. You know. We're two episodes away. You know. You know. But thank you for listening to this episode of the Duels and Mandarins podcast. You can get it every other week on Patreon, uh, one week early and ad free. We're going to post on Wednesdays, asterisk when thing when the equipment works correctly and then post it the following monday for free feeds uh that will have some ads this time probably for the proxy forge and if you support us on patreon 
If you at the fifteen dollar tier higher, you can get your name read at the end of the show, like Brandon Vol did. Thank you, Brandon. Thank You're you, Brandon. fantastic. You're wonderful and amazing. Otherwise, you can join the Patreon for free if you want to ask questions, vote on polls, that kind of stuff, and just get access to the Patreon feed in general. In the meantime, peace.